Hello friends, so for today's video, I'm going to be tier ranking all of the books that I read this last summer. Because there's quite a few books on this list, I'm not going to go really in depth with what the books are about, nor am I going to elaborate extensively on my feelings as I think that the tier ranking essentially shows you how I felt about them. But if you do want to hear more about these books, any videos I've done where I go more in depth, I'll have linked in the description bar down below. Also, and I'm sure this goes without saying, but I just like to be as clear as possible that I by no means am trying to imply that some of these books are objectively better than other books on the list. This is just purely the books at the top are the ones that I connected with the most, the books at the bottom, the ones I connected with the least, and then of course everything in between. That said, going through what the tiers are, because it's a summer reads tier ranking, I wanted to have some summary things for the different categories. So the top tier and the best tier is just good old fashioned water. It's how I feel about these books. I feel like they provide me with something essential, <laughs> as dramatic as that sounds. After that, we have ice. I love ice. I love both literally just frozen water and then also the carbonated ice drinks. I pretty much always have one around and it's not sponsored. I just really like these. So I have this as the second highest tier. The middle tier would be storms. I love moody weather. I love temperamental weather. I just think there's something about moody weather that just it makes the world feel so alive but at the same time sometimes they cause things like leaks and every now and then it makes it really difficult to drive and you get these flash flood warnings or the dust storms are so intense that you can't even see when you're trying to drive somewhere so they're really awesome but I have conflicting feelings because sometimes there's some negative aspects to it as well. From there we have the pools category because this is a very summery thing and I don't like going to the pool. I would like going to the pool if it was just me by myself. That's never what it is. It's, it's always a community pool or other people are around. You get sunburned. I don't like swimsuits and chlorine and it stings my eyes. And <laughs> I just, I'm not a big pool person. So these are books that, you know, I'm not really all that big on. And then at the bottom, heat. The heat category is like, this is, I don't like this. I know other people like this. I don't. Now jumping into all of the books that I will be tier ranking here, so I'm just gonna go through them really quickly. Getting into it, we have Ship of Magic, Vagabond, Babel, House in the Cerulean Sea, These Twisted Bonds, The Darkening, Mad Ship, 56 Days, What Moves the Dead, Belladonna, Aurelian Cycle, so all three of the books in that trilogy, all three of the books in Mistborn Era 1, Ruination, Art of Prophecy, The Liar's Knot, Dark Rise, Royal Assassin, For the Throne, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, Full Metal Alchemist, Book of Gothel, Master of Iron, A Venom Dark and Sweet, Alloy of Law and Shadows of Self, Half a Soul, Monsters We Defy, This Vicious Grace, The Ballad of Never After, Redemptor, Grace of Kings, The Final Strife, Long Shadow, Violet Made of Thorns, The Dragon's Promise, Inadequate Air, The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy, 10,000 Stitches, Love on the Brain, and The Love Hypothesis. I always think it's more exciting and a little bit more fun to tier rank these by starting in the middle and then slowly branching out to the extremes. So I'm gonna start with the Storm category. That said, kicking it off, I'm gonna start with the book Dark Rise. I liked the writing style of this book, but the way in which the story is told, I think that you almost feel like there's this disconnect between you and the main characters, and I understand why. One, it feels more plot-driven than character-driven, and then also I think there are some reveals that happen later that could not happen if you did have more of a connection with the characters. So I understood why it was told the way it was, but it did impact my overall enjoyment. After that, we have a book that is a sequel, and that would be The Liar's Knot. I liked Mask of Mirrors a little bit more than Liar's Knot. A lot of my friends who I kind of buddy read this with, they they really liked Liar's Knot, but I felt that this is already a fairly complex world and you're introduced to a lot in the first book. I was excited for the second one to feel like, okay, now I have my feet on the ground. And so from here, I can be along for the ride, but I did feel like we were introduced to a lot of other new things, a lot of other new characters and sometimes didn't get enough time to get to know those things well enough to where when big impactful moments happened, it 
it ended up resulting in me not feeling the impact as much as I would have liked. After that, we have What Moves the Dead. This one had a couple things working against it. I'm not the biggest horror fantasy reader. I do like the occasional spooky thing, but in this case, it's not something that I typically gravitate towards. I did like this one, but there's something about with something frightening in a story that sometimes when the search for an explanation is a big part of the book, it almost takes the scary factor out. It's like by knowing or maybe knowing that there is a solution to whatever is occurring, something about that results in me feeling a little less afraid. It's almost like if your stomach hurts because you know that you ate junk food, you're like, this isn't a big deal, I ate junk food. But if out of nowhere your stomach is hurting, you're like, what's going on? That's scarier, does that make sense? Anyway, I did enjoy the writing though. I like T. Kingfisher's writing style. Her voice is fantastic in her book, so I liked it. But like everything else in this category, didn't love it. A little bit different, we have the book 56 Days. This was a mystery thriller that I buddy read with my mom, and there were a lot of twists and turns in the story. There's also a fractured timeline, which definitely always kept me guessing. And I found that the book had some questions that you as the reader, you have to really reflect on, which I wasn't really expecting in this story. That said, I, I think that there were a few things about the reveals that it almost felt like we continuously had to top the previous reveal to a point where, I don't want to say it got cheesy, but that feeling where you're just like, okay, this is getting a little out there. I will say though, I am partial because I buddy read it with my mom and anytime I buddy read something with my mom, almost guaranteed it's going to be something I enjoy, mostly because I just enjoy the, ex the experience of reading something with her. And also it's fun to branch out of fantasy every now and then. Returning to fantasy, but with a little bit of an asterisk, as this book also is sometimes considered just fiction, we have Babel. And this is one where there's so many things that R.F. Kuang did that I absolutely loved. And there were so many times I was incredibly gripped by what was happening. I think that the book is really powerful. I think R.F. Kuang is doing a lot to bring something fresh and unique to the fantasy genre while still pulling from things that we are familiar with. That said, some of the themes I felt were would have benefited from there being other perspectives beyond just the one that we get. There's other perspectives sprinkled in here and there, but they're very, very brief. So really it is essentially through one person's point of view. And with some of the really, really big themes that we're tackling in this book, I just think it would have hit a lot harder to have more perspectives. I am still going to continue to check out RF Kuang's books. I am just, I feel like I'm still waiting for the book by RF Kuang that I finally just, everything lines up and it clicks with me. Next up, we have A Venom Dark and Sweet, which is the sequel to A Magic Steeped in Poison. This is a duology, so this is the last book of these two, and I thought that the way everything wrapped up was surprisingly, there was a somber feeling to the story, which I wasn't really expecting, and I liked that it wasn't the most perfect, clean, type of ending, especially with YA fantasy. I know that there is this idea that all YA fantasy is ending happy and that there are no real stakes, which I know is not true. But when you have a story where the tone truly is a little bit on the sadder side and there really is a lot of grayness to the story, meaning that it's not everything's really tragic or everything's really extreme emotions. There's just this very realistic, raw feeling to it. It's unexpected. And I liked that about this. At the same time, I wish we could have dug a little bit deeper into some of the characters. And I actually feel like the magic was so interesting and the world was so interesting. I actually think I would have liked this series to be maybe a little bit longer and we could have spent a little more time with everybody, all the characters, the world, etc. After that, we have Grace of Kings. This is another one, kind of like what I was saying with Babel, where there are so many things about it that I really liked. I like how politically driven it is. I think that this author has a way of giving you just a little bit of information about a character and just breaking your heart. It's almost like a short story every now and then. And those moments were fantastic, but this first book covers so much time and it, it ended up feeling at times like we were being told about a bunch of events 
and then you'd get some emotional scenes and you'd be told about a bunch of events and that would go over a series of years and then you would it just ended up making it so that I thought the book could have actually been split up into several. I think this first book could have actually been an entire trilogy all on its own and it would have made the book hit so much harder because there are some devastating things that happen but because we skip over so much time it just ended up being like I couldn't really appreciate everything that was happening and everything wasn't hitting the way I was hoping. So still plan to continue the series but I wish that we had dug a little bit more into this one. After that we have The Final Strife. This is a new release, it's also the first book in a series and this one has a lot of where it leaves off that makes me excited for the sequel. There's so much about this one that I can see being really exciting. There's this cast system and the way that things leave off and the reveals that you get, I think that this series could end up going in a direction that I really, really like, but it was a first book in a series and there was quite a bit of introductions to the world, to the cast system, to the characters. It takes a while to get going. And so I liked it, but I'm kind of waiting to see what we have happen in the sequels. The Dragon's Promise would be the next one. This is another sequel and it is another end of a duology. I think I liked this one more than a lot of other people seem to be liking it. I have seen some criticisms that the marketing made it seem like this was going to be this amazing setting that took place primarily in this one area. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to reveal things for people who haven't read the first one. And we actually end up going to quite a few different locations. It felt more like a personal journey for the character rather than the adventure that we had in the first one. I liked the personal journey of the character. I do feel like the first one maybe balanced personal growth alongside that adventurous fun feel a little bit better than the second one did, but I still enjoyed it. Next up, we have The Inadequate Heir. This is the third book, technically, in the Bridge Kingdom series, although the series is set up kind of strangely in that the first two are essentially a completed duology, and then this third book introduces characters that you saw in the first two, but you didn't really get to know. It dives deeper into those characters. And it's interesting because the majority of the book, the timeline of it lines up with events from the first two books. So that was an interesting experience and I thought I wouldn't like it, but I actually really enjoyed getting to see, oh, so that's what was going on with those characters when this was happening in the second book. So that was fun. But I found that in the first two, the balance between the romantic elements of the story and the political, I really liked the balance. And in this one, the balance wasn't quite the same. And then also the love story between the characters. I liked the character's love story in the first two more than I liked this one. Speaking of love stories, next we have The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy. And this one definitely leans way more, I would say, into the romance category than it would the fantasy category, but I still liked the way that fantasy elements were incorporated into the story. I didn't absolutely love the main two characters. It is sort of an enemies to lovers story and they were just genuinely quite cruel and rude to each other. And I did like when they eventually turned things around and actually spoke to each other like human beings. It could be patient and understanding, but there was some frustration throughout the first chunk of the book with their behavior. It felt somewhat childish, especially because they're not incredibly young characters, so I felt like they should be a little bit more mature. After that, we have 10,000 Stitches. This is the second book after Half a Soul, and it was very cute. It was very charming, but it had big shoes to fill because the first book, Half a Soul, in this series of standalones was just so adorable and precious to me, and this one wasn't quite hitting at the same level. It was sweet, but it was also a little extra silly. So I liked it, but I didn't love it as much as the first one. The last two for the storm category would be the love hypothesis and love on the brain. These were fun. It was, like I said at the beginning of this, when talking about 56 days, it's fun to occasionally branch out of fantasy, but I didn't love these. They were they were a nice break between fantasy. They were the thing that kind of helps you keep from getting in a reading slump because they're just you they're very easy to devour. You can just flip the page and get kind of swept up in how ridiculous they are and how silly they are. And so it was very it's, I always feel like this sounds very negative. It was very readable, <laughs> but it wasn't anything 
extraordinary or hard hitting for me. From here we'll be opening up, we'll be going into the pool category and then the ice category. And I actually do have more in the ice category than the pool. So we're gonna alternate between them. I'm gonna start with Vagabond. This is a manga about a real samurai that existed. And I read the first arc of the manga and quite liked it. I am excited to read more. I think that the best is yet to come, but I did quite like that initial part of the story. I think already I can see how hard hitting it likely will be. And so for an introduction to a story, I think that it revealed a lot. Next up we have Belladonna. This is one that I was quite surprised I enjoyed as much as I did. It does have death as a theme in the story, but it was a little bit different because it was less about what happens after you die and more death is personified and so they are therefore a character essentially in the story. And it had this gothic setting that I really ate up and I really enjoyed. There's a mystery element, essentially a murder mystery type of feel to the book. And the way everything came together, I was just, I was surprised by and I quite enjoyed. After that, we have Ruination. I just am excited to have more to consume that is within this world. So I know I'm partial for that reason, but also I thought it was a solid fantasy standalone. It was fun, it was adventurous with the occasional, oh my gosh, kind of moments in there as well. And it was a fantasy standalone that wasn't super, super cute, because I think that's becoming more popular now to see these kind of cute fantasy standalones. We also get a lot of mythology retelling standalones. And so it was nice to just have this, it felt like kind of classic adventure fantasy. And it only took one book and it was solid and I liked it. Jumping really quick down to the pool category, we have House in the Cerulean Sea. I've mentioned this one quite a few times recently, so I'm not gonna say a whole lot. This is one that I think the themes are really powerful. I think the messages are really important but it was a little extra syrupy sweet for my personal taste. The next two are quite different from one another, but I liked both of these. And we have the Book of Gothel as well as Art of Prophecy. I loved the mentor character in this story. I liked the mentor character was basically the main character. And I liked the way that we took some tropes that we think we know where the book is gonna go because we've seen these tropes so often but they were flipped on their head. And then it kind of left me wondering well, what's gonna happen next. And I really enjoyed that feeling. Book of Gothel is an origin story for Gothel, the villain in Rapunzel. And it was less of a fairy tale type of story and much more historical fiction with little bits of fantasy mixed in. And I actually really liked it. I liked the atmosphere that the author created. I liked the way that she wrote the setting. I thought it felt as if I was being transported to that time, but it is definitely a slower moving book. And I know it's not gonna be to everybody's liking, but I did like it. I loved this next one, Master of Iron. I thought it was so fun. I've talked about how Trisha Levenseller's books, the first book in this duology, Blade of Secrets, as well as Warrior of the Wild, they're just so cute and fun, adventurous YA stories that are so lovely to pick up in between big epic fantasy. This is one that I considered putting at the top just because I have such a good time with it, but it doesn't really hit that full range of emotions that I want in my absolute favorites. It hit all the, oh, this is so fun and yay, it hit those <laughs> sorts of things, but it didn't hit the, the lows uh, to go alongside it. So it was great. I really liked it. If there was another tier in between these two, it would probably fit in, in that one. Going down, we have Mad Ship by Robin Hopp. So a lot of you may recall that I loved Ship of Magic a lot. We'll talk about Ship of Magic later. Um, I loved Ship of Magic and I did not love Mad Ship. And we will also talk about uh, Ship of Destiny very briefly, which I also didn't love. But Mad Ship for me, it definitely had middle book syndrome. I can't believe it's the longest of the trilogy because it feels like the least amount of things happened in this middle book. And I loved the first book so much that I had very high expectations and it just didn't quite end up living up to the first book for me. Next up, we have both Alloy of Law and Shadows of Self, the first two books in Mistborn Era 2. It's fun to be back in Skadrial. It's fun to be back in the Mistborn world. It's fun to see the magic system again, to expand on the magic. Still not my favorite of Sanderson's works. 
I don't have characters in Mistborn Era 2 that I absolutely love the way I love Kaladin from Stormlight Archive or Vin from First Era. But the setting is so different from so, so many other fantasy books. And I genuinely like the sort of detective feel that you get with these. I think that they're fun. And I think they have some surprisingly emotional moments, but they're just not absolute favorites. Next up we have Monsters We Defy. I was quite surprised with this one as I don't typically gravitate toward historical fantasy where the setting is within the last 100 to 200 years, but I thought the way that the author delivered the setting was actually really exciting and fresh and original. And the story is what I have described many times at this point as a cozy heist type of story. I liked the characters. I liked the way that the characters were introduced. I liked the magic. I just ended up having a lot of fun with this one. After that, we have Violet Made of Thorns. This was kind of an angstier YA fantasy. And the reason I'm kind of putting it a little bit more on the lower end of the tier ranking is that it didn't really, it wasn't all that memorable for me. And I felt like the enemies to lovers, the tension between the characters, it just, it didn't deliver in the way that I was hoping it would, because there is something that can be very entertaining about characters that like they basically hate each other, but then also they really love each other. And there's just that back and forth. That's a terrible way to explain it. But I, I just didn't feel like there really was that much tension between the characters. It kind of just seemed like they hated each other and then sometimes they'd be making out and I was like, okay. After that, we have This Vicious Grace. I definitely quite enjoyed this one. I thought the way that it incorporated both the plot, which was interesting and set up really high stakes right away, the way that it incorporated that alongside the development of the relationship between the characters, I thought it balanced those things really well and it just made for a delightful read. Next up, we have The Ballad of Never After. This one does have that tension that I was wanting from Violet Made of Thorns and it's got everything just dialed up to a hundred. Everything is really over the top. Everything is really absurd and ridiculous. And it's one ridiculous thing after the next. And I just have such a fun time with these. I had a fun time with the first one. I had a fun time with the second one. The ending is really exciting. I can't wait for the third book. Next up, we have Redemptor, the sequel to Ray Bearer. This is a YA fantasy duology that I think has a lot of depth to it. It's definitely one where it is young adult, but I can see this being something that adults read and find there's a lot to it that they really connect with or that they really appreciate in it. And it does have some darker themes in it or some darker elements. I think the emphasis on friendship definitely always gets me because I just don't see too many stories. And so seeing the characters, how much they care for one another, the found family in it, I think is done really well. After that, bumping back down to the pool category, we have Long Shadow. This is also in the same series of standalones as 10,000 Stitches that I mentioned before. And this one, I liked the mystery elements, but it does kind of have that whole thing again with what happens after you die and then also being able to communicate with people who have passed and I just don't seem to very often click with those kinds of stories. Now jumping to the top tier and the bottom tier. And I'm gonna start up here at the top with Ship of Magic because I already mentioned this one before. I just figured we'd kick it off with this one. I loved Ship of Magic, basically everything about it. I loved the character work. I loved the character relationships. I loved the depth. I loved how much there was to uncover and why the dynamics between the family members are the way they are and how you view them one way and then the more information you find out, the more you kind of understand certain characters. And I loved the gray morality. I loved the villains in the story. I just, I loved to hate some, some of the characters in it, the world building I thought was fantastic. Everything I loved. I loved it so much that I immediately went to my local used bookstore and I was like, what do you have for Realm of the Elderlings? Because I want more. <laughs> and then I technically didn't read Ship of Destiny in the summer, but I'm just gonna mention it here to kind of close out Live Ship Traders. And Ship of Destiny is gonna go at the bottom. I liked I, the more I think about Ship of Destiny, the more I dislike it. And I don't know that I'm gonna continue reading Hob at this point because I didn't love the first two books in Farseer. I'm not really interested now in finishing up that third one because I really didn't care for Ship of Destiny. I mean, that's, that's a bummer, right? When you read the conclusion to a series and 
with Ship of Destiny, I mean, when you read the conclusion and you disliked it to a point where you now don't like, you almost retroactively don't care for the other books. But and it just makes me even more frustrated because I loved that first book. And then the middle book, I was like, all right, it's the middle book. It's okay if there's some, you know, we got to introduce new characters. We got to come out of that first book and then sort of present things for the third book, build the stakes, put everything way up here so that you're terrified for everyone. And I just didn't like basically any of the decisions, <laughs> any of the plot points within the, I would say, second half of Ship of Destiny. I just didn't like the direction we went with basically anything. There was one plot line where I was like, all right, I, I kind of like this, but most of the rest of it, I really didn't care for. So that's why this one's at the bottom. The next three, I reread Fireborn and Flamefall in preparation for Fury Song. All of these three are at the top. I really don't need to elaborate. It's one of my favorite series of all time. Jumping now to the bottom again, we have These Twisted Bonds. This was the sequel to These Hollow Vows and it's one of those fantasy stories that is kind of similar to A Court of Thorns and Roses, which I also don't particularly love. This one, I just, I didn't really care about the characters. I didn't really care about the plot progression. I think a lot of it was not particularly original. So it was just something that once I was finished with it, I, I just didn't really have a whole lot of thoughts. It's not like Ship of Destiny where I was like, Gah, grr, angry now. I just didn't really have very many feelings. Next up, just like with Aurelian Cycle, I don't need to elaborate too much. We have the Mistborn trilogy, the first era books. I reread these. I still love them. Next up, we have The Darkening, and this is one that I, I almost feel bad putting it here because I didn't find myself really, really frustrated or angry and annoyed at this book. The first part I really liked. And then the latter half of the book just went in a direction that I didn't love and it kind of felt like two books in one. And like we had almost uh, two different plots and the plot that I was getting in the first portion of the book I really liked and then we didn't really fulfill that plot the way I was expecting because it kind of turned into, it just felt like it turned into a different story. And so I didn't hate it. I'm excited to see what the author does in the future because I liked the writing style. And like I said, I really liked the beginning. I just think that the the story itself didn't end up really working for me. The next couple are very similar as far as they are fantasy and romance combined. They're both really cute and really charming and really sweet. And that would be Half a Soul and then The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. I've mentioned these both a few times in uh, in some other videos in the past. These were just absolutely adorable and precious and fantastic pick-me-ups. Excels at the highs in that it's so charming and so sweet and so cute. And when it does touch on some heavier topics, they're maybe not earth-shattering, apocalyptic type of everything's gonna die if we don't save the day. It doesn't have that level of, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? But it does have very personal, a character experiencing PTSD and trying to let go of that anger, you know, something like that. See characters that just are dealing with their own personal struggles and that is something that I appreciate it as well. So while they're not as epic in scope, they do, like I said, excel at the highs and I did enjoy those highs very much. For the Throne is going to be the last book here for the bottom tier. I, this one was one where I enjoyed the first book for the wolf and then the second book, it was necessary to complete the things that were left unanswered at the end of the first book, but I actually didn't really care for this story that much. It felt too detached from the characters from the first and the characters we're focused on, I wish we'd gotten more of them in the first book so that I cared about them a little bit more in the second book. At the very top, we have Full Metal Alchemist, another favorite that I reread. And at the time that I'm filming this, I've already finished rereading all of it. So I've only put up a couple of videos so far because I am doing a read along. And then I just devour the rest of the series because I love it so much. I love it so much. It's just the best. It has the best range of emotions. It has some of the absolute most heartbreaking things in it. There's a whole section that goes into the trauma of war and soldiers when they're fulfilling their orders, what that entails, and it's just devastating. But then you also have 
quieter moments that are so hard hitting and then you have some really great like yes it's just so good but anyway that is it for a tier ranking of everything that i got around to this summer at least everything i think that i got around to i might be missing a few things here and there anywho thanks so much for watching like i said at the beginning i'll have videos where i go more in depth in the description bar down below if you're interested i hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you later bye